So as we already mentioned, today's speaker is Ronald Green, speaking of Why Nothing Matters. Now, Ron brought some of his books, so if you do want to buy the book afterwards, you can, uh, he'll be hanging around to sign them as well. Which, um, I'm, I'm hoping I can get a similar signature to when Ariane Shireen came up and I got her to sign it. You're my personal hero. <laughs> <laughs> So, just as we do this, as ever, I'm going to be passing the donations hat around. If you do like what we do in Skeptics and want us to move to a pub, please do so. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, even a couple of thousand <laughs> secure the mortgage on, on a freehold, so that really would be appreciated. Other than that, I will hand over to Ron. Please welcome him to the stage. I hold that back. But first of all, uh, I've spoken to a few skeptics, and you're the most skeptical skeptics I get come across, which is very worrying. Because um, uh, supposedly you're skeptical about something. That means you wouldn't be skeptical about nothing. On the other hand, you would be skeptical about nothing, so there would be nothing to be skeptical about, which is a huge problem. I haven't even started yet. Anyway. <laughs> Um, I s presumably you've come here, well first of all thank you for coming to here about nothing on a Saturday afternoon, yeah. which, is, which, is, which is good. Um, I'm not sure if you're expecting something or nothing. If you're expecting nothing, I can quote Alexander Pope who said, Blessed be he who expects nothing, or he will never be disappointed. So, if it's nothing you're going to get, it's going to be great. If it's something, and it might be, but that's, that's the secret of today, that, that's, a, that's an, another matter. Now what I am not going to speak about, this Why Nothing Matters, and the title of my book is Nothing Matters, I don't mean that nothing matters, I mean that nothing matters. By E, I mean that I'm not talking about uh, the pointlessness of it all and, and, and uh, existentialist angst, etc, etc. I'm not speaking about that there is nothing that matters. What I'm saying is that the concept of nothing matters. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, my, 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 my question is, um, if, if anything matters, why should, why should uh, nothing matter? And it, and it does. A lot, I'm, I'm going to show. Um, for there, is, uh, there isn't anything I have found that nothing does not touch and does not touch nothing. So what we're going to look at is uh, very, very briefly, I haven't got that long, but I can speak about, uh, about nothing for hours, as is my vote. <laughs> but I won't. Oh, uh, but I won't. <laughs> Thank you. But I'm going um, to expect your, your questions. Because you won't have any, of course. We know. I'm going to answer all about life and tell you what it's all about. And that'll be it. It's all about nothing, by the way. So, we're going to speak about nothing in history and the arts, very interesting by the way, and religion. I see I won't have any, <laughs> any opposition here to what I said, <laughs> from, from what I gathered <laughs> about religion and nothing, which is very, very important, nothing in religion, and science. And then at the end we're going to, we're going to try and discuss what, what nothing is, which is the basis of my, uh, of, of, of my work. Uh, basically, um, uh, I see nothing as a, as a portal into the world of, of ideas. It's, it's not so much uh, what, or equally, what nothing says about things and what things say about nothing. And I find uh, nothing as the, the basis of many, many things. So, um, by the way, you're not going blind, it's done that on purpose. Um, so what is this nothing? that we can't actually see, touch, or feel? Is it absolute? Um, or, or, is it, or is it relative to, to other things? That, that, that we're going to check now. And, 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 if, and if we manage to talk about it, and think about it, and write about it, then perhaps it's something. And if it's something, it's not, it's not nothing. Okay? Um, th this, this is the precisely the a mystery of nothing. The more you think about it, the more, the more that's there. Now we have this uh, uh, cliché that says 
we come from nothing and we go to nothing. Doesn't mean very much, and we'll be talking about on that particular thing, but what it does, what, what's interesting about it, it seems to intimate that we are in the center of nothing. That, that, that nothing is all around us, which, which is true. Because uh, I, am, I am not this table, and I'm not you, and I'm not this computer, and one of the reasons is, is, the, is the space, the space between us, the, the, the nothing around us, the nothing that makes us what we are, makes us us, in fact. Um, so where there is something, there is nothing. And there, and, and there has to be nothing in order for there to be something, okay? Which is uh, which is quite uh, which is which is quite nice. In any case, let's see what we if I can find a little little thingy here, which is gone. Okay. So um, that's why I look towards nothing. It, it is as important as something. This is my point. Nothing is as important as something. In fact, it might even be more important. They say that 83% uh, of the universe is next to nothing. It's not nothing, because they found that there's no such thing as, as nothing. And that's, that's an important point. 83% consists of, uh, of, uh, of dark, uh, dark matter and uh, dark uh, energy, etc. 83%. So, why not look at non-matter? instead of looking at matter. Maybe we can shine a light on, on, on matter. That's where it is. Okay. Now, what I found very interesting is that nothing has a sort of a uh, duality. The, the nothing that we're going to look at, in one hand, has an attraction towards it, the urge to get towards nothingness, as we shall see. At the same, same time, there's a fear. If you, look in, if you look into an abyss, you want to leap in, and yet there, there's the fear. And I'm, I'm going I'm to show that now. This is something you'll all like from, from what I hear. Um, but this is the fear, the fear of nothing. Uh, believe it or not, um, the Middle Ages, civili Western civilization was held back by 600 years. 600 years because the church would not accept nothing. What happened was that, that, that Muslims brought in a new numerical system from the Far East, India, and they brought it in su successfully. It boosted M Muslim Europe, but they were, they were doing the mathematics and the science, etc., etc. But Europe stayed where it was because the church would just not accept what it wouldn't accept, by the way, is zero. Right, now, zero is not nothing, but the church did not accept the zero. It, for them, it was a mystical thing, and, mm -hmm. and zero is out. Now, we all know that zero in the numerical system is not nothing. Right? Now, why, why did the church, why were they so much against the concept of nothing? There, there are two reasons, two reasons, at least. One is that when God created the universe, he created it from nothing. There is... The universe is here, therefore there can't be nothing. And the second, the second thing, which, uh, which is more interesting to what I'm going to talk about, is that the idea that if there is God, there cannot be nothing. God makes it something. Now the whole idea, the whole mysticism of nothing was just too much for the, for the church to actually bear. And it, it was also at a time when the church was, was fighting, not even the Muslims were fighting a hell of a lot of things going on, and they, they weren't going to fight anymore. Zero was, zero was out. Unfortunately, of course. So this I find very funny. Because they meant that nothing is impossible with God. But in actual fact, it's true. Nothing is impossible with God. Because if there's God, there cannot be nothing. They have shot them. Luke shot everybody in the, in, in the foot through this. But of course they didn't say it the way... The way I said it, because I have an obsession with nothing. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I want to I want to go into this particular idea of nothing being something before we move move on to the more mystical part. I don't know if mystical in a religious sense. Don't don't worry. 
This basket has nothing in it, correct? We all agree. But obviously it does have something in it. It's got all sorts of stuff, microbes and dust and God knows what. Sorry about that. And, um, okay, this basket has nothing in it. Now this basket has apples in it, has oranges in it. If I take the apples and the oranges out, both of those have nothing in them. Each of them has nothing in them. And yet, this one has, has nothing which, which refers to apples, and the other one has nothing which appear, refers to oranges. Those two nothings are different. When you, when you look at those baskets, after you know what's in there, when somebody says there are no oranges in this one, you say, no, 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 That's not, there are no apples in this one. The, the nothing is different. Okay? Looking very, very, very skeptically. <laughs> it's okay. I know it's okay. Your answers will, your questions will come. When I'm here, I can't get out of all this stuff to take. So, let's, let's look at the even, even more worryingly. The 8 minus 8 is 0, nothing. And 5 minus 5 is nothing. Now I know that mathematically 0 is 0 before you attack me on that. I know that. Okay? But this 0 refers to no 8s. And that 0, that, that nothing, refers to no 5s. Okay? These are different absences. Zeros can be different. The holes in cheese are the absence of cheese. They're not the absence of anything else, the absence of cheese. Right? So, I call it, I call it the presence of an absence. absence. It's very important that the, that the absence is something that you can actually feel and touch. There are, so, what I've shown you is there are different nothingnesses. Nothingnesses. So, nothing can be silence, like uh, Beckett and, and uh, Pinter, they used silence in a tremendous way, and the silence was as important as the words, as important, okay? Or uh, the gap between, between things, objects, or silence in, in, in music. All these are the absence of something, and I call this nothingness. Okay, and I'm going to move on. This is nothingness, which is, which is an it. It is a feeling. It, it, it exists. No, this nothingness exists. So that's why I call it the presence of an absence. I, I recently, by the way, finished, finished a book, which I don't know if any of you read, called uh, Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Safo. And I actually, I'm, since I notice nothing everywhere, where other normal people <laughs> reckon to see, see things, I see nothing. So, so on the very, very first page, I was delighted to read, well, not delighted, it's a bit sad, but six years later, my mother's absence remi remained in the air around us, a deafening silence that I had not yet learned to stifle with words. It's the silence that you, the, the absence that you can feel. We, we all know that uh, if we know somebody who died and we come into the room where that person had been, we feel that person's presence. That is, that is an absence. My favourite picture, putting these two together. Um, I, I, would sing, I would sing it to you, but you know, I haven't got a microphone. But Elvis recognised recognized this, this uh, nothingness. Do the chairs in your parlour seem empty and bare? Do you gaze at your doorstep and picture me there? Okay? Um, in Sartre's book, uh, Being and Nothingness, he noticed that when he came late to a meeting with Pierre, he, he saw the absence of, of the absence of Pierre and not the absence of the Duke of Wellington. Okay, that is very important. And yet this is not enough. Because we keep on colliding with absolute nothing. There is another nothing. There's a nothing that I don't know if you can feel. That's, that's what I'm coming into. The feeling that, that nothing is the secret of life. <coughs> uh, um, in, in art, it's very, very interesting. There was uh, an artist, uh, Ad Reinhardt, who in the 60s painted a black square. And then he painted another black square. And then he painted another one. For five years, 
This bloke was painting black squares. He, he, he wanted to get to the basis of art. He thought by taking away everything, you're going to get, you're going to, get it to, to the basis, to what, to what life is about. For well, five years he did this, you would not be surprised he committed suicide. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is, you know, when you can't get to it, you can't get to it. And there was, um, in uh, conceptual art, he's very, very big on nothing. In 58, <coughs> Yves, Yves Klein in Paris had an exhibition called Le Vide, The Void. And this was more or less, more or less the beginning of uh, conceptual art, more or less, where his exhibition was an empty gallery, completely empty. And all the, all the, all the who, the who, oh, everybody went to, to see this amazing exhibition that had nothing in it. He also committed suicide, by the way. Just by the way. <laughs> okay? And, uh, I mean, this is, my book has got, um, and the, and cha in the chapter about art, lots of these people, who did the most amazing things to get rid of everything they could in order to get to to nothing, to to get to this 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 nothing, and nobody, of course, nobody succeeded. A black square is not nothing. A black square is not a representation of nothing. It's a black square. Now that's uh, that is tough to to uh, get to. But, um, there was uh, Michael Asher in '73. <laughs> He stripped the walls of a, of a gallery. He just stripped the walls. And I'm sure the owner said to him, you put that back the way you found it. Anyway, he also, he also couldn't, he, he, you know, it just wasn't enough. It, it's not enough to have bare walls. You've got to strip the walls. I've got to get to nothing. He didn't. Okay? Okay. I'm going to, I want to show, show some interesting things. Cons this business of moving to less and less did not start in the 60s, although most things did of course, but, um, but when you think of art and, uh, and uh, Renaissance art, with all the tiny, tiny details and all that magnificent stuff, things, things happen. Now, Constable could not be called a conceptual artist, of course, okay? And he said, painting is but another word for feeling. He moved, he moved away, he, he took things away. This is this is very, very, this is not a, 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 a pretty church and flowers and stuff. Uh, look at Turner. Look at, look at that. Look how much he's taken away to get his scarlet sunset. And uh, William Hazlitt, English uh, literary critic, said about Turner, Turner, the great Turner that we think is, you know, he said, all is without form, he said, too much abstractions. Not like nature, he said. All is without form and void. Some said of his landscapes that there were pictures of nothing. Look how insulted my nothing this has lit. This is like nothing, he said, because because what he said was this is this is this is not nature, this is this is I, I, I want I want pictures, I want I want to see the church, I want to see the flowers, I want to see that. And he, he went on about that. Whistler, the white girl, all these things, all these things, you know, this is classic art now, but when this came out, it was laughed at. It, 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 was, it was ridiculous, they said. This thing was, was all white, practically, and her face, without any expression at all. They said, how the hell can you do a thing like this? Where, where is the, what's, what's the point? Where is her expression? What is she thinking? Etc. Etc. Monet, I mean, look at it. There are people taking away more and more and Pierre Modran, a Dutch, he took away all sort of expression. And he just started, this is a Picasso after Picasso. He took away any sort of presenta representation whatsoever. And Rothko, my favourite <coughs> artist. Rothko, who you, you know painted these magnificent uh, colours, etc, etc. And Rothko said, sudden, Rothko also committed suicide. By the way, I have a whole list of people who <laughs> didn't say so. But I, but when I stopped the book, that was okay. I was, I was on the verge. Stop the book. Now I said it. I'm okay. Right? So, don't worry. All right. So, Rothko said, certain people always say that we should never go back to nature. I notice, he said, they never say we should go forward to nature. 
So he was showing, but by showing less, we show more. And uh, by the way, I, I think what he really said it was a bit, bit, he said basically, I can do better than, than nature. I think that's what he meant. I mean, this is, you know, it's terrific. I was on a plane the other day, and this is more or less, this is more or less what, what you see. I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's magnificent. Are, there, are you allowed to ask? Yes. Presumably, that is a conceptualized sunset, is it? So, or something like that. He, do, he doesn't say. It's what oh, he wanted to be. Yes, he, yeah. he, he never, he never. He never said, he usually you know, he says red and black or red, blue and green. He never actually said yes. He wanted you to, to, to see what you would see. And, and, and Rothko is one of the few painters where you want to get really close to see. That, that's, that's the amazing thing. Rather than going back, you really go, go in, into it. Uh, so, eventually of course, obviously you're going to get to this. If you take away enough, you're going to get to a complete, complete blank, or not, actually not. And then there, there it, it wasn't just black, by the way, it's also white on white. And there are a lot of whites on white, and there is Kazim, Kazimir um, um, uh, Malevich, a Soviet painter, who, went, who tried very hard to get into the good graces of the Soviet Union. He painted this, why his interest why he's interesting is we're going to come to a bit later, but Malevich is a name I, I want to come back to for, for various reasons. Now, you can try all sorts of things to do to get to not doing what you... I'm sorry, am I? Are you okay? Yeah. Um, for example, if you don't want a cover to your book, you put on no cover. But of course, writing no cover is not a, is not a, is not a, not a, not a not cover. It's a cover. I mean, you know, you do crazy things. I mean, oh, and... I don't know if you realise, you cannot get absence of sound in a, in a film. You can't do it. It's impossible. And they try. Actually, they, they have to put a tiny bit of... I read something very interesting. They have to put a tiny bit of sound in so you don't think that something's gone wrong. It's a, it's a very, very strange thing. But by the way, even in a soundproof chamber, but completely soundproof, there's no silence. What you hear eventually is yourself. You hear your heart, you hear your pulse, you hear all sorts of things. You cannot, cannot get to nothing. Um, um, John Cage wrote his, I'm sure you know, his four minutes, 33 seconds. A uh, it was a piano piece. It was a, Silence. <laughs> silence, right? 4 minutes 33. Uh, whether he wanted to get to silence in the beginning and afterwards realised he couldn't and then pretended it was something else, that's just my conspiracy theory. But he wanted to get to, to nothing and of course it wasn't nothing. It definitely wasn't nothing because, this, because when you sit for more than two minutes you begin to hear things. Listen. There's this hum. And if, if, you, if you listen in a concert hall, in absolute silence, you begin to hear amazing things. You begin to hear things from outside, little people sh shuffling. In fact, every concert, in inverted commas, was different. Every single one, because the people were, do were doing diff different things. So basically, the idea was <laughs> to, to, to take off more and more and more and more, because the, the urge the human obsession to get to nothing, in my opinion, is phenomenal. It's a, it really is an obsession. And, and uh, I don't know if you've seen the Beatles' uh, Yellow Submarine. Did anybody see it? It's a, a, a cartoon, etc. Anyway, at one point, there is a sort of um, an a animal that's a sort of vacuum cleaner. And it goes around and it sucks in everything, all the walls, everything around. It all sucks in. Eventually, it turns on itself and it sucks itself in. And an absolutely brilliant concept of what, what I'm talking about. There was, obviously there was nothing left. Because what we were looking at was a, a blank screen. Okay? So, I just want to recap now to, to show you where, where I'm moving. Okay? I'm talking about the absence of something versus the absence of everything. 
which is the, the whole point of what I'm trying to say now. All through thousands of years, there have been other skeptic societies in pre-Socrates and post-Socrates and all sorts of, and everybody was trying to talk about nothing. Okay? And uh, pa Parmenides, which is pre-Socrates, he said, what is, is understandable, but what is not, is something that cannot be imagined. He was right, and he was not right, because, because a, a certain type of nothing, what I call nothingness, can be imagined. We can imagine somebody not being there who was there before. We can imagine the apples and the oranges not being there. But the, the other thing, what is not, is what we're moving on to. And here, here he was right. And Melesis was more right. I mean, he was clearer. He says, nor is there any void, for void is nothing, and nothing cannot be, which is the point of my talk today. Nothing cannot be. He was spot on, I think, very early on. Aristotle, who is quite a clever cookie, he, look, he, look, he looked up and he looked up at, at, the, at the sky and the stars, this great vast nothing between the stars, and he said, cannot be. He said, uh, there cannot be absolute absence because how do these things move? There has to be something that, that moves them. It cannot be empty. He was right for the wrong reasons. He was right. Quantum mechanics posit uh, that there is no such thing as nothing. And the 83% I talked about before, which we would have called nothing a few years ago, they found it isn't nothing. Which back, backs up my claim, I'm delighted to know. But all these people, among others, spoke about nothing and got mixed up and, 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 and mixed them and mixed uh, the difference between the absence of something, the absence of everything, etc. I put it here because I like, I just like it. Now we move on. Okay, nothing matters. And I've shown you where, where others fail. 2,500 years ago, uh, uh, later, I come along. That, that's, that's me, folks. And I have separated, I have separated and demystified and made more complicated at the same time the problem of nothing. And I have said, look, we have to make a difference in the absence of something and the absence of everything. And it will, it will, and, and the absence of something I call nothingness. And the absence of everything I call nothing. Okay? And this will help us, this will help us solve certain problems and prove to us that there are problems that we can't solve. And that is important. Even, even if you're a skeptic. No connection, sorry. Um, religion, your favourite topic, I understand, is very, very big on nothing. Right? All, all religions. For Western monotheistic religions, nothing is, is the start. It is the miracle. It is the first miracle and the miracle. It is something that has to be. Without, without nothing, God is no big deal. Because God had to create the universe from nothing. If he had created it from, from whatever, clay, then, then there's no big deal. Because you, you'd ask, where did the clay come from? He had to, had to, create the world from, from nothing. That's all the, the three monotheistic religions. Nothing is the, the beginning. Okay? Uh, it's problematic, by the way, also for science. Sorry to mention this, but we'll, we'll go into it a little bit later. For those who want to throw stones at me. Which is fine. Ah, my favourite slide. <laughs> for, 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 Eastern, for Eastern religions, nothing is also important. Because for them, it is the getting rid of all the extra, extraneous stuff and all the outside world and, and, and everything that you think of, get rid of more and more and more. And to the end, you are left with nothing. You, you rid you rid yourself of your of yourself so that you are you are open and that is the, the truth. When there's nothing there, that that is that is the that is how you get to the to the truth. And now we can see that if we if we use my uh, differentiation, we can see what actually the point is. What we think is that nothing is the common denominator. 
between the religions. They're both interested in nothing. That's not true. What happens, and it's the difference between the West and, and, and the East, very, very, very roughly, right? The West, the Western religions, start off from um, nothing. And we build ourselves up. We learn more. We build. The whole point of, of Western civilization is you, you build yourself up into something. It's capitalism. It's, it's uh, all that stuff. It's, it's you, you build yourself up. Whereas the East, you, you start as a human being and you gradually get, get rid of stuff until you are o over there. But, it, but in actual fact, in actual fact, they, deal, they don't deal with nothing. They deal with different nothings. Because this, this nothing, the absolute... Oh, I've, I've got one of these. Hang on. Oh, oh I just remembered. This, this one is, is nothing. Absolute nothing. It's very important. And this one is nothingness. Oh, no, this is my favourite one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, just we're saying nothing is the absence of everything. Yeah. Right. Okay. Is it right that the Eastern religions, right, um, with the individual, you have to you have to purge yourself of everything, right? So, in a sense, the entire universe is present in each individual. In, in a sense, would that, uh, including God, would that be would that be the case? Because surely, you're, you're if, if you're trying to purge yourself of everything, right? The, the 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 whole universe and the God that created it would dwell in the individual who was purging themselves. Is that correct? May, may I? May I? May I hold on with that question until I get to the All end? All right, okay. Is that okay? Okay. So that I can get, get together the whole picture. All right. Which might not answer, it, but okay? Okay. Thanks. Okay, so, now we get, we get to the crux of the afternoon, folks. Um, all religions and faiths and cults, all of, them, all of them have one thing in common. An underlying common denominator, which is, of course, nothing. Okay, I maintain the raison d'etre of every religion, belief, faith, cult, what in every single one, and I've looked at thousands, have one thing in common, and that is that they state that death is not the end. That there is something that we can do, or not do. But this is not the end. That, that's, that's important. Every cult. They all have something to, to, to say about it, whether it's uh, souls and, and, and whether it's the East, or whether it's paradise or purgatory. But the point is that this is not the end. So don't need to worry, folks. Well, you do have to worry if you're naughty in, in some religions. All right? And, and that, by the way, not real connection, but maybe, that um, it gives power to the priests of, of, of whatever religion. Because the priests know, don't they? They know better than we ordinary folk that what we have to do in order to get to the, to the place in a, in a good sense, right? If you're naughty, you're going to go to hell. If you're good, you're going to go to heaven or whatever. All right? If, so, that's, uh, uh, the, so what I'm saying is the impossibility of accepting nothing. Of accepting nothing. The inability. This is the point. Not to about denial as such. I'm talking about the inability to get to nothing. Cannot be done. I'm going to get questions on it, which is fine. Um, artists could not represent it, obviously, because it cannot be, it cannot be envisaged. Humans cannot envisage a point where they are not. And before you leap at me on that, uh, uh, I'm not saying that you cannot imagine the world without you. I'm not saying that. But when you do imagine that, you are doing the imagining. What I'm saying is that you cannot imagine what you can't imagine. We cannot, we cannot imagine nothing. It is humankind's obsession. We cannot do it. So Mark Twain said, <laughs> deny. <laughs> so, now, religions are big on, on, uh, on denial. Everyone is. 
also science. Because science has got this stuff now called uh, uh, techno-immortalists. So the idea is that, first of all, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, for example, if we keep on changing organs, we can, we can live forever. Right? Very clever stuff. And it's also called <coughs> transhumanism. That's an, uh, true. That's transhumanism. Correct. <coughs> and, the, and the, yes, correct. A techno immortalist <coughs> is that in theory, at some point, we will be able to uh, download our brains, our minds, onto a computer. And that will be us. My question is, and it's not, it's just interesting after lots of beer, that if you download your mind onto a computer and you get rid of your, your brain, <coughs> is that computer you? But you know, don't answer that. I don't know the answer. Okay? I do not know the answer. There's something I don't know the answer to, apart from nothing. Okay. So it, it's, not, it's not denial, folks. It's the impossibility of grasping nothing. The absence of everything. There are, there, are, there are quite a few people, some very clever people who wrote about this. Why can't I find this little thing when I need it? Okay. Oh, I have it here. All right. Hang on. I just want to give you some, some examples of, um, of, of people who've been writing about this and very, very, and very, very clever people. Ray, Ray, Ray Kurzweil, futurologist and genius. He wrote, uh, he wrote quite a few books about, uh, books about li living forever. I and mean, he, he's serious. I mean, this is no joke. I mean, he believes it. All believers believe. Well, what, what, what can you do? <laughs> and there is Francis Fukuyama, which you, you obviously met, meant, Our Postmodern Future. It's a very nice book. And he explained about you can keep on harvesting organs. So therefore, you're going to live together. It's wonderful. And Julian Barnes' memoir on death, nothing to be, to be frightened of, I love that, nothing to be frightened of. See, it's terrific, lovely, I might have to have a talk with him. Ah, I, I mentioned uh, uh, Malevich, remember? He, he of the white squares, very, very interestingly, I think, that uh, we're talking about science that it, that, that's going to help us live, live forever, in the Soviet Revolution, they sincerely believed that science, the power of and they were really, if there's anybody anti-religion, anti even more than you lot, were the, were the Soviets. I mean, they really, they didn't just talk about it, okay? <laughs> they got rid of everything. And, uh, but, but, despite that, they believed that science eventually would make us, it would be possible for us to live forever. And when Lenin was embalmed, by the way, that the, the idea was, the idea was that eventually science will come along and Lenin will live again. This is amazing. And why do I mention Malevich? Because Malevich was the one who designed um, Lenin's tomb. Ta da Okay. That is, that is the link between, between nothing and living forever, etc., etc. Et well, I thought it was good. Okay, okay, fair enough. And now I come to my piece de resistance. Well, I posit the nothing gene. I posit um, the nothing gene as a, as a survival gene, as an ever evolutionary mechanism. The point is, a, a, some sort of mechanism does not, not allow us to envisage nothing. It does not allow us to. We can't. We can't. It helps us get up in the morning. Because if we possibly could imagine what it's like not to be, it's a pretty scary thing. We might not get up in the morning. But since we cannot envisage being dead, we can envisage dying. We can envisage other people. It's always somebody else, by the way. Do you realize it's always somebody else who dies? And you realize that. Always. But always. Okay. Always. It's very important. It's never us. Because when we are dead, except for that hum, there's nothing. All right. So this nothing gene allows us to not see what it's like not to be. 
And, and uh, what I've been talking about today is the relationship between something, nothingness, and nothing. And why is that important? It's not, it's, it, the relationship between those three is what makes us, us. Okay? I spoke about the uh, spaces, I spoke nothingness, that, that makes, gives us our, our uh, individuality. We are what we are because of the space around us. But it's, but it's nothing, it's nothing that shows us, shows us our limitations. That means that we are, we are what we are, but we have limitations. If I may, if I may quote from my book, and I love quoting myself, it's the only person I like reading. Um, While nothingness shows us what is, nothing allows us to understand our own limitations. Both show us what it is to be human. And I will end with paraphrase from Bertrand Russell about philosophy. Dishonoringly simple. The point of nothing is to start with something so simple as to seem not worth examining, and to end with something so paradoxical that no one will believe it. And that is nothing. And I thank you for listening to me, and I'm ready for your questions. If, if there are.